It is certainly an honor and a privilege to be here, to be back in Lawrence. Um, I'd like to extend my sincere, sincere appreciation to the Black Law Student Association for, for inviting me. And I certainly echo those sentiments when it comes to Professor Pearson. She always has an open door policy, but I was more familiar with her closed door policy where I could go in there and cry and nobody would know. <laughs> On this, the 60th anniversary of the Supreme Court's Brown v. Board decision, I've been charged with sharing with you how this decision has impacted my legal career and why diversity in the legal profession is so essential to the continued struggle for justice for all people. My third year of law school, I attended a prosecutor's summit in Chicago, Illinois, and the purpose of the conference was to introduce graduating law students about opportunities in the greater Chicago area. I attended and there were several presentations that were given but one that was noteworthy to me was a presentation given by then U.S. Attorney for the Northern District of Illinois Patrick Fitzgerald and you may remember him from his time in New York where he prosecuted members of the Gambino crime family, the 1993 World Trade Center bombing, a special prosecutor in the Valerie Plame investigation and then went on to prosecute Governors Blagojevich and Ryan when he became U.S. Attorney. And at the conclusion of his speech, I had the opportunity to talk to him personally, and he had a few words about why diversity is so important in the legal community. It's vital because in all aspects of our legal system, we need people that represent everyone on all sides for our justice system to act appropriately. His parting words to me were, a prosecutor's job is not just to seek justice, but to also give light to those who would never see it. Ladies and gentlemen, I was hooked to sign me up. That sounds good to me. <laughs> My final year of law school, I interned at the Johnson County DA's office in just so happenstance that many of the prosecutors there uh, that were female were away on maternity leave. So. I had the opportunity to handle a lot of cases that I probably shouldn't have been able to handle. But by the time I graduated, I had close to 30 bench trials and three jury trials under my belt. And as you can imagine, the Johnson County DA's office is a pretty good place to work. You have career prosecutors, ample resources, great juries. So people stay. So I decided perhaps maybe I would take the Illinois bar and work at the Cook County State's Attorney's Office as a prosecutor. So I applied and they invited me to come out to interview. And the first interview took place in an elementary school, a rundown elementary school in Chicago. They didn't explain why. They didn't explain why we were having the interview sitting on children's furniture, but we did. <laughs> And you never know how these things go, so I fly back to Lawrence, uh, not really knowing what happened or how well I did or how terrible I did, but the phone rang again and they said, Mr. Wamba, would you like to come out for a second interview? I said, well, certainly. Now the job only paid $35,000 a year, but I'm flying back and forth trying to figure out if this was something that I wanted to do. And as a perk of the job, they said, well, you know, many of our rookie prosecutors actually qualify for Section 8 housing, so keep that in mind. So the second interview, I go back, and this is two seasoned prosecutors from the Violent Crimes Division, and I guess they wanted to know if I was tough enough to be a shy town prosecutor, so they smoked cigarettes and dropped F-bombs during the interview. <laughs> Again, you never know how these things go. So I fly back to Lawrence and I wait. So the third uh, interview came and they said, are you still interested? I said, absolutely, so I, I'm committed now, so I go back. I stay in this crummy downtown Chicago hotel and the next day the cab driver drops me off at the city hall. I take the elevator up to the 55th floor. I check in, I'm sitting there with my little stacks of resumes and transcripts and writing samples. As I'm sitting there in the lobby, a middle-aged black woman pokes her head out of her office and says, come here. <laughs> I didn't know this woman. I didn't know what she wanted. So I stood up. I've got manners. I'm from Oklahoma City, as you heard. <laughs> and she must have read my mind because I'm thinking, what if they call for me and I'm in your office doing whatever it is that you want me to do? 
and I miss my opportunity because I don't have enough money to, to fly back. <laughs> so I go in the office, she shuts the door, and she says, boy, do you know what you're doing? <laughs> and I said, well, ma'am, I, I'm here for my final interview. She said, yes, and that's exactly it. This is the final interview. Do not screw this up. <laughs> So she said, well, I'm concerned because there's not many black males that make it this far, and I just don't know if you have what it takes, so have a seat. She pulled out from her desk drawer a sheet of paper, and she handed it to me. She said, now, they're going to ask you some questions off this list, so I want you to study it real quick. And I thought, is this a joke? Is this some sort of <laughs> test? You can't give me the interview questions before. So I read it. I mean, I... I read it. There's no sense in lying now. And I handed her back the paper and she shoved me out of the office and I went and sat in the lobby. A couple of moments later, she opened her door and called for me as if we had not had that earlier meeting. And at that moment, I realized that to her, I meant so much more. She was from the south side of Chicago and she realized that she wanted someone that looked like her, that had the same experiences as her, representing her in government. So I'm walking into that conference room thinking, I can't screw this up. <laughs> now, this is the final interview, and you know it's the final interview when you're sitting at the conference table. I'm looking at it, Lake Michigan. I see the Sears Tower, skyscrapers as far as the eye can see. But I knew it was the final interview because sitting at the conference table were three silver-haired white men. When you see the three silver-haired white men, <laughs> this is the end of the road. <laughs> Decisions will now be made. <laughs> the interview started and there was two gentlemen sitting next to me and there was another gentleman sitting across from me and uh, I thought the interview was going well. I, I recognized some of the questions from my earlier meeting. <laughs> but what bothered me during the interview is that the gentleman that was sitting next to me didn't say a word. He just stared at me. I thought, I get it. All right, here's the intimidation. Good cop, bad cop. I ignored him. So I kind of felt good about the interview, took the cab back to the Ratty Motel, and I walked into the motel bathroom. I looked in the mirror, and tears started to well up in my eyes, and I couldn't believe it. See, the night before, I needed some hand lotion. So I went to the CVS down the street and purchased, I guess, what women put on themselves before they go out for the evening. It was lotion with glitter. <laughs> and so I had gone to the Cook County State's Attorney's Office with my face and hands covered in gold glitter. <laughs> and I thought about that black woman in the lobby that said, don't screw this up. I can only imagine what the men were thinking. Did he really come in here with gold glitter on his face? Fortunately, there was a position open at the Johnson County DA's office. So I thought I'd go ahead and take that. I began work in 2007 as a prosecutor at the Attorney General's office, and it was fantastic. Traveled the state on behalf of Kansans. I'd go from Kansas City to Dodge City to Liberal. And it was fantastic. And it's funny how in every courtroom in these rural counties, these rural towns, they would always know that I was Jabari. Even though I'd never met them, they'd come up to me and say, you must be Jabari Wamble. Yes, I am. And I remember being in Parsons, Kansas, and it was a long docket, and I was sitting next to an attorney that had done some mission work in Africa. And he said, don't, don't tell me, don't tell me. I'm going to guess where you're from. And I thought, oh boy, Kenya. No. Nigeria. No, no, sir. Central Rwanda. No, sir. And in my best African accent, I said, sir, I am from central Oklahoma. A place called Oklahoma City. Home of Garth Brooks. And a word of wisdom to young attorneys that want to be trial attorneys, be careful. Keep an eye on your parents as they get closer to retirement. I was trying a case in Emporia and my parents decided they wanted to see if I was gainfully employed so they attended the trial. And uh, there was a break in the trial and I pulled my mother to the side and I said, Mom, I appreciate you and Dad being here for your support and they are here today as they always have been in my life. But it's distracting when you cheer when my <laughs> objections are sustained. 
I'd stand up and say, hearsay. <laughs> the judge would say, sustain. I'd hear my parents back there, that's right. That's right, baby. That's distracting. One weekend, my parents drove up from Oklahoma City to visit, and we took the afternoon off, and I was still at the Attorney General's office, which is on 10th Street in downtown Topeka. And we drove just a few blocks down the street to 1515 Southeast Monroe Street, home of the Brown v. Board National Historical Site. And as we toured the exhibits, much like the pictures that you see here depicting life in the 50s and 60s of segregated schools, those pictures resembled my parents' historical educational experience. Shortly after the Brown decision, my father, who was one of eight children, the son of a Methodist preacher, found himself at newly integrated elementary schools in Kansas City, Missouri. The sentiment was, now you can attend, but we don't have to teach you anything. The black students were given no books, no paper, no instruction. And my father and his fellow black elementary school students were relegated to a corner of the classroom where they were forced to sit on the floor and largely ignored. Later, my father and his family moved to Little Rock, Arkansas for junior high. That's Little Rock, Arkansas. You can imagine things got worse. Each morning was an emotional time as the Womble children prepared for school to board buses that would take them to various schools throughout Little Rock. And as government officials expressed their disapproval of an integrated school system, children were attacked, buses were swarmed, and my father and his siblings were never entirely sure that they would meet each other back at home after school. Fast forward 55 years later as I stood next to my parents in Monroe Elementary School. Both of my parents are college graduates. My mother, a retired educator. My father, a retired engineer. It was certainly a reflective and beautiful moment that through the pain, that through the heartache, that through the fear, they knew that each successive generation has the hope of a better future. A few years back, I attended a KU alumni event at a watering hole, just like the one we have in the back. And I was there with a classmate of mine, a um, good friend of mine that we met in law school. Matter of fact, he was a groomsman in our wedding. He and his wife are the godparents of our daughter, Bailey. And as is the custom when we meet each other in custom or circumstances like this, we usually are lodging insults back and forth. He was telling me how nefarious I was for being a prosecutor and taking away people's civil liberties. <laughs> I told him how greedy he was because he worked for a Fortune 500 company. The type of hurtful things that you only say to people you truly love and care about. And as we were talking and doing what we do, another attorney who graduated from KU Law about 10, 15 years before we did, started asking us about our law school experience in Green Hall. He looked at us and said, are both of you summer starters? And we said, yes. He said, did both of you land in the same small section? We said, yes. We sat next to each other in Professor Hines' Civil Procedure 1 class. He said, did both of you have all of your classes together? And we started to kind of get weirded out a little bit. Yes, we did. And then he walked over to the bar and let us kind of figure it out. And then we realized that um, all this time we thought we were friends because we liked each other. <laughs> we didn't know that there was an administrator at uh, KU that thought that two black men at KU Law School would need the support of each other. And this is all alleged. I don't know this to be fact that we were forced to be in that same school, in that same class, against our wishes. But I have two words for whoever decided that that was a good idea. Thank you. I think we've learned from the past that you can't just send children to the corner of a classroom or isolate students on a particular section of campus or abandon female attorneys in the basement of a law firm because they decide that they want to have a family. We are in this together. Someone understood that we must do more than just admit students or hire attorneys for diversity's sake. We have to give them the encouragement and the skills that they need to be successful. Now every place that I've worked as an attorney, I've been the only one that has been this height, if you know what I mean. 
And I often hear that there were no quality black applicants. Imagine, if you will, Coach Bill Self having a press conference, and he's addressing the audience. And he says, ladies and gentlemen, I've gone to New York. I've gone to Los Angeles. I have gone to Atlanta. I've gone to Miami. And I was unable to find any qualified black basketball players to play on my team. Would anyone in this room believe it? That would be completely, utterly preposterous. In fact, the complete opposite is the case. KU Blacks have been on the basketball team long before anybody over in University of Missouri would even consider it. <laughs> the legal profession needs the same commitment. It may not always be easy. It may take some extra work, but it's something that the legal profession desires. As we celebrate this 60th anniversary of Brown v. Board, we have to figure out where do we want to go from here. To the law students, you have some decisions to make. Are you going to live in the ghetto, or are you going to live at what I call a millionth in Metcalf? The ghetto, you say. Yes, the ghetto. Brookside. <laughs> the lawyer's ghetto. Many of your classmates are already there. But the decision whether you'll have a Cape Cod in Brookside or a McMansion in Olathe will largely depend on education. Do I want to live here and pay for tuition, or do I want to live in Johnson County where they have decent quality public education? Look no further than the Kansas City, Missouri School District as evidence of an underfunded, underperforming school and how it affects an entire community. And quoting Chief Justice Warren, who delivered the opinion in the Brown decision, today education is perhaps the most important function of state and local governments. Compulsory school attendance laws and the great expenditures for education both demonstrate our recognition of the importance of education to our democratic society. It is required in the performance of our most basic public responsibilities, even service in the armed service. In these days, it is doubtful that any child may reasonably be expected to succeed in life if that child is denied the opportunity of an education. These words are true today as they were in 1954. As an undergraduate, I was a member of the track and field team, and I had a coach from Birmingham, Alabama, and he had these sayings, many of which we never really understood, but if we were having a lackluster performance at a track meet or practice, he would yell at us, don't prostitute your talent. Assembled in this room this evening are policymakers, educators, community leader, leaders, and future lawmakers. Let us not prostitute our talents. We can focus our attention on drafting legislation that discriminates against same-sex couples and sprinkle a little religious talk on top of it to make it palatable and continue to make ourselves the laughing stock of an entire nation. Or we can focus on ways to combat poverty so that children do not have to go to school hungry. We can focus our attention on inventing ways to make it more difficult for people to vote or we can focus on properly funding our schools so that we can continue to educate and nurture our future leaders. Now I've prosecuted a few immigration cases in my day at the Department of Justice and I can tell you what I've never heard. Usually after a prosecution for being in the country illegally there's a jail sentence and then you're deported. On the way out of the courtroom I've never heard not one single defendant say when I sneak back into the United States the first thing I am going to do is I'm going to slide into a voter booth and commit voter fraud. I've never heard that, not just, not one single time. We can focus on introducing silly legislation that allows us to spank our children and leave red marks on their behinds. Or we can attain ways to make education affordable for everyone that wants to achieve it. Let us continue our long legacy of diversity and inclusion that has been the hallmark at this institution from its inception. And in the words of James Weldon Johnson, let us march on until victory is won. Rock Chalk Jayhawk, go KU.